Hello everyone. Now we go to the next macromolecule that is protein. Basically, we will look into protein, the macromolecule, and also the monomer, the amino acid. Some interesting thing about this uh, slide itself, you have two ways of providing the model for protein. These are the actual model that's been used to describe the 3D conformation of a particular protein. Of course, here we just put here uh, the uh, effect of temperature on protein. Temperature or high temperature can uh, cause denaturation of protein. Next, we look at the uh, amino acid and also the functions of protein itself. Of course, the amino acids are the building units of protein. There are actually 20 important amino acids that will be used in order to make many, many types of proteins. And then in terms of uh, protein function, uh, protein has the most number of functions. That's why it's called the workhorse uh, macromolecule. And then in terms of the function, you have some of it given here. It is uh, making up the structures, uh, structures such as uh, uh, the protein of carotene that is found in hair, horns, uh, fingernails. Uh, these are all continuously uh, growing uh, even though you cut it. And then you have uh, oxygen transport. Uh, apart from hemoglobin, you also have uh, another one that is known as myoglobin. They tend to keep oxygen and then also transport the oxygen to where uh, it is required. So other than making structures as, uh, as well as uh, in terms of oxygen transport, you also have hormones and enzymes made up of uh, proteins as well and also other functions uh, such as cell membrane component. Cell, cell membrane component is made up of not only lipid bilayer, protein, uh, also cholesterol. We will see in detail about this uh, cell membrane when we come to the lecture of uh, lipid. So in this uh, slide, we look at the amino acid. In terms of the uh, common uh, or general structure of amino acid, it will have a carbon in the center and that carbon is referred as alpha carbon. If you have more carbons attached in the R group, then it will be considered as beta carbon and further as gamma carbon and so on. In terms of the basic structure of an amino acid, it should have carbon in the middle, a carboxylic group, an amino group, hydrogen, as well as the R. The R group is the side chain of the amino acid and comparing the 20 amino acid, the R is the one that changes from one amino acid to the other. Then on this side, you have uh, you've been given in terms of the idea about two amino acid coming together or three amino acid coming together and further on to make something known as polypeptide in terms of the polypeptide the one that keeps it together is the peptide bond or amide bond this peptide bond or amide bond are made because of loss of uh, water molecule or also referred as the process of condensation. And here been highlighted the fact that there are 20 amino acid and in terms of the amino acid, it could be either in the form of D or L stereoisomers. The D or L comes about because of the stereogenic center of an amino acid. What is this stereogenic center? 
a stereogenic center must have four different groups uh, so they must have four different groups connected to the carbon in the middle therefore it can then give rise to the stereoisomer either D or L so this is continuation of the previous slide to explain about the stereoisomers L as well as D and in terms of normality or generalization the L amino acid is the one found commonly in nature the D type is more of a synthetic uh, structures uh, that uh, been uh, occurring or been purposely synthesized when it comes to nature all are in L uh, amino acid here also shown uh, another way of uh, uh, coming up with the stereoisomers uh, they could be either in D or L or in a chemistry through chemistry uh, manner uh, R uh, as well as S now, R uh, rectus uh, S sinister although we rarely use this R S compared to D or L amino acid and uh, as the facts uh, stated there the L amino acid is more uh, in the form of S configuration uh, S is more of uh, it somehow causes uh, uh, rotation to be clockwise while uh, rectus is anti-clockwise okay? uh, and then uh, below uh, shown that the isomer of uh, L amino acid as well as D amino acid and what is L amino acid if you have the carboxylic group to be on the right and the R group on the left that can be uh, one easy way to recognize L amino acid and if you put a mirror you will get a reflection and this is D amino acid or you build the D amino acid by putting the carboxylic group on the left as well as the R group on the right so that will be D amino acid to get L or D amino acid <coughs> you must have stereogenic center an example of something that does not have stereogenic center is been given here where it is glycine you can see the carbon is attached to hydrogen again by hydrogen therefore it is not uh, having a stereogenic center uh, this means it does not have D or L uh, amino acid for glycine so this slide is just a way to uh, you have 20 amino acid therefore what if you have to write it uh, in a sequence normally uh, they refer it as primary sequence uh, so if say it is made of 40 amino acid how do you write it do you put into the full name as uh, been shown in this column as well as this column or uh, you make it easier for you you can also use three uh, letters as been found in these two columns or if you want to make it even easier you just use one letter as been shown here but the trick about using the single letter is a bit uh, complicated uh, especially if you don't have this table uh, because if you look at it you have D which uh, uh, stands for aspartic acid simply because uh, A already been taken for alanine and then <clears throat> you also have uh, R been used for arginine so uh, uh, it's not as straightforward compared to uh, using three letters or the full name okay? so a person like me working with protein very much familiar when it's been shown as three letters because we know uh, just by looking at the three letters what is the full 
name uh, could be. If you read uh, some biochemistry book or even go through website relevant to biochemistry, the 20 amino acid is actually grouped into different different groups based on some uh, physical aspects or the chemical aspects of the amino acid itself. In this lecture, we group it as a neutral amino acid, acidic uh, amino acid, or basic amino acid, uh, that 20 amino acid itself. Uh, here you, you've been shown the neutral amino acid where uh, none of them have charges so they are, therefore they are neutral amino acid but bear in mind uh, they are also uh, within this uh, neutral amino acid they are also uh, specialized amino acid for instance uh, you have phenylalanine tryptophan as well as tyrosine these are three aromatic ring uh, uh, types uh, ring structure amino acid you will uh, when you do the biochemical uh, biochemistry laboratory uh, this will be covered in terms of uh, detection using 280 nanometer of uh, uh, using the equipment spectrophotometer where the assay uh, detects maximum uh, because of the presence of these uh, aromatic uh, ring structured uh, amino acid but that's uh, just to give you an idea but uh, in terms of the neutral amino acid they also have other groups within them uh, that's what I'm trying to uh, highlight here so this uh, slide uh, is a continuation of the previous slide so you see uh, there is also uh, other types being grouped as acidic amino acid as well as basic amino acid acidic because it's uh, a donor of hydrogen uh, so these aspartic as well as glutamic acid they have additional carboxylic group apart from the general structure of amino acid and the uh, extra carboxylic group can be a donor of hydrogen so it is acidic uh, and then you have basic amino acid there are three they have additional amino group and therefore the amino group can uh, receive hydrogen uh, ions and therefore they are referred as basic amino acid there's also something else to highlight you can see the essential amino acid uh, you can see been labeled asterisk within this slide as well as the previous slide if you have a look at the previous slide there are many amino acid has been highlighted as asterisk the labeling for this amino acid should have around 10 so 10 out of 20 amino acid uh, in humans we cannot uh, make this 10 amino acid therefore we have to get it from the diet but plants and microbes can make all these 20 amino acid uh, therefore for them there's no such thing as essential amino acid but for human these 10 are referred as essential amino acid while the other as non-essential uh, essential amino acid all right uh, now i'm going to go a little bit faster uh, because of time limitation uh, basically uh, the amino acid come together and become uh, primary structure where uh, many amino acid come together be become a polypeptide chain and you can use any of the 20 amino acid to build a particular protein but the sequence must always be as uh, uh, specified for that particular protein 
uh, the uniqueness of the protein is this uh, polypeptide chain does not stay as a single dimension but actually bend and fold because of the uh, location of a particular amino acid the contribution of an amino acid the r group plays a major role and this been shown here where you can see the uh, s group comes about because of the presence of hydrogen bond hydrophobic interaction disulfide bridge ionic bond so looks like because of the r group uh, located at a particular uh, region of the polypeptide chain it makes up certain bonds certain interaction to allow the shape that is been uh, finally achieved the uh, reverse s uh, shape as you can see here so the 3d conformation is the one that plays a major role for protein function so this uh, slide uh, is uh, continuing what i have just explained in the previous slide about the contributions of hydrophobic interaction disulfide link uh, ionic interaction hydrogen bonds and uh, also van der waals uh, interactions in order to make the 3d conformation of a particular protein uh, just to uh, make you understand uh, all those that i just mentioned are non-covalent except for disulfide uh, uh, link or bond or they also call it thiole bridge because of uh, cysteine, uh, 2 cysteine amino acid uh, that is in fact a covalent bond uh, so a protein you have the uh, two amino acid come together because of peptide bond that's covalent and then uh, one long polypeptide bends and folds because of the contribution of mostly non-covalent bonds and uh, there's also this uh, uh, remark here about uh, sickle cell anemia uh, this is uh, interesting because uh, uh, hemoglobin uh, or red blood cell has uh, its biconcave uh, shape as shown here okay it's biconcave okay uh, and the reason is being a biconcave shape is because it has two uh, 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 altogether four polypeptide and it has 140 amino acid within the polypeptide uh, chain or four subunits but due to certain mutation the individual will have one of the amino acid in the chain to be replaced uh, what was hydrophilic type of amino acid will become hydrophobic and because of the, that chain or a chain in one amino acid it will cause it to be hydrophobic and attract other uh, chain to come together or other hemoglobin to be attracted to it and finally what supposed to be a biconcave red blood cell will end up as a sickle cell uh, as shown there and that is not normal and if a person is homozygous they will end up dying because this uh, sickle cell is very uh, uh, not elastic like the biconcave uh, red blood cell and it will cause uh, it to be stuck in the capillary of a person uh, blood vessel and therefore they will die but if they are heterozygous uh, then they will have both biconcave shape as well as sickle cell and also other abnormal shapes they may survive uh, 
until old age. So you have the 20 amino acid and within the 20 amino acid you have certain exceptions or unique amino acids. So this slide covers those unique uh, examples of unique amino acid that is proline, isoleucine as well as threonine. Proline is uh, unique or special because it is uh, having secondary amine. Uh, all the other amino acids are primary amine but this one secondary amine because uh, from the alpha carbon it's sort of like joined back to the amino group uh, so it makes a, a ring structure uh, that's secondary amine okay. then the isoleucine and threonine are also considered unique because they have two stereogenic centers compared to the other uh, amino acid the significance of having two stereogenic center will cause more stereoisomers uh, than having one stereogenic center. One stereogenic center uh, will provide uh, DNL or two stereoisomers. If you have two stereogenic centers, then you will have a total of four stereoisomers. Also, uh, again, uh, been highlighted about these facts where about essential as well as non-essential amino acid so in humans uh, not in microbes or plants where you will have uh, in the human body a person cannot uh, synthesize within their body around 10 amino acid but in microbe and plants no problem they can synthesize all 20 uh, in human since cannot synthesize the 10 therefore you have it from the diet uh, either consume plant or other uh, or any animal uh, or uh, you know uh, yeast or algae uh, then you will get it through the diet and that's why it's called essential amino acid uh, to differentiate between non-essential amino acid where you can make it in your body so here we're going to talk about how a protein you know it made so made up of a lot of amino acid or just one single amino acid what happens to it when you move it from an acidic environment neutral environment basic environment you will see because of the amino acid uh, firstly it will be in the form of they call it zwithyronic zwithyronic or zwithionic okay. it is negatively charged positively charged you would assume so far i've been teaching you the amino group will have uh, carbon in the middle hydrogen and then amino nh2 uh, cooh and then the r is the one varies but in actual uh, physiological condition it actually uh, will become zwitheronic that is having negative charge as well as positive charge the hydrogen from here actually goes to become connected to the amino group therefore you have this zwitherion okay and that's in ph7 when you move this zwitherion or zwitheronic uh, group of amino acid into ph2 environment acidic uh, you know acidic there's a lot of hydrogen ion so since amino acid is a buffer it will tend to neutralize it the hydrogen ion so what happens is the hydrogen ion will be accepted by this uh, carboxylic group and at the end the state of the amino acid what was negative and positive will now be 
positively charged. So when you move a neutral zwitarionic uh, amino acid to a pH 2, it will be positively charged. Next, if you take the neutral amino acid and move it to an environment which has pH of 10, what happens now? In a pH of 10, basic environment, there's a lot of OH negative, less of hydrogen ion. So what happens is, the hydrogen from the zwitter ion will be released to the environment in order to neutralize the OH negative. Therefore, at the end, the amino acid will now have negative charge because hydrogen here is gone. Okay. So if you take a zwitter ionic uh, amino acid, you put it into a basic environment at the end it will be negatively charged what is the purpose in actual protein uh, research if you have many proteins they use this knowledge to separate the protein from other proteins in chromatography uh, the, chrom the chromatography that has been utilized is ionic uh, chromatography, ion exchange chromatography. Okay? But that you will learn in year two in enzyme technology. Okay? So this uh, slide is uh, explaining about that Zwitarion. Uh, that is, uh, it is not really in the form that has been shown here, but Actually, in physiological condition, it will be a zwitterion, whereby it will have positive as well as negative charge. How it comes about is uh, because of the two electrons here, where it can form uh, a bond with the hydrogen. So this hydrogen goes and forms the bond with the two electron. Uh, therefore, this will be negatively charged, while this one, since receive a proton, it will be positively charged. So this zwitterion is actually a salt, and it will be the form that is normally found at physiological uh, conditions, that is uh, at pH 7. Uh, seven. Uh, next, we look at the peptides, then we're going to look into proteins, uh, the level of complexity known as primary, secondary, tertiary, as well as quaternary structures. But here, the peptides uh, are joined together uh, by amide bond. They are also known as peptide bond. And uh, if you have two amino acids coming together, uh, then you will have a loss of uh, hydrogen as well as uh, loss of ox, uh, hydroxyl group to uh, come, uh, come to uh, rise of loss of uh, water molecule, that is condensation, then you will end up with one peptide bond uh, somewhere here. Okay? If you have tripeptide, again, it, through the process of condensation, you will have three uh, uh, amino acid with two peptide bond. Okay. Um, here it's been said thermoprotein is anything of a polymer of more than 40 amino acid but it's just a, a generalization not uh, supposed to be taken uh, serious as a serious facts. So this uh, slide, as well as the next slide, is about uh, uh, confusion uh, and then how to actually uh, come about in uh, the correct nomenclature uh, in uh, naming proteins, uh, the sequence, how you put together uh, two or more amino acid in sequence. How do you name it? 
So they give you alanine, cysteine, then the next slide they give you cysteine alanine. What is the confusion is, is it same if you put alanine and cysteine together or if you put cysteine on the left and alanine on the right? Do you, uh, will you get the end product to be same? What is, what has been found out? It is not the same because if you have alanine and cysteine and then forming the peptide bond for the alanine the amino group will be found while for the cysteine the carboxylic group will be there but if you have it in reverse that is cysteine on the left as well as alanine on the right you will not get uh, the alanine now with amino group but instead you will have it with carboxylic group and then you have cysteine with the uh, amino group not the carboxylic group as been shown here so in order to recognize this confusion need to come up with right way of nomenclature or right way of naming a particular polypeptide that is having amino acid in sequence. So I'll cover that in the next slide. So this is continuation from the previous slide. So you already know that uh, alanine cysteine arrangement is not same as cysteine alanine in a dipeptide. So there could be confusion if you have a longer polypeptide, uh, which is the right way to write the sequence. So the uh, International Biochemical Society, they came, uh, came out with a convention on uh, writing the sequence. Okay? So by convention, you need to first locate which is the uh, N-terminal. The N-terminal is the amino acid that is having the amino group which is free and then you put it on the left side and then you look for the carboxylic group okay, and then uh, put it on the right side then you name it as cysteine alanine so this is N terminal to C terminal so you do this by either using the abbreviation on one letter or the three letter abbreviation that is found in the table that uh, some slides ago I have uh, I, uh, explained to you. Okay. So here uh, talking about the tetrapeptide where within this uh, uh, box some important uh, facts been uh, given where it is uh, always in uh, zigzag form okay and also if you look at it the carbonyl group compared to the nitrogen and hydrogen is always 180 degrees away from each other so this slide is just talking about these two facts so this uh, is about the naming of the amino acid not so relevant uh, but just to explain if you have glycine alanine put together the dipeptide will be known as glycyl alanine if you have tetrapeptide then it will be known as Taraxyl alanyl cysteinyl glycine. That's it uh, in terms of naming. So, a bit uh, difficult if you have like, you know, 40 amino acids. Now we come to uh, polypeptide that is found in nature. Uh, one that has been taken example here is the bradykinin. It has nine amino acid uh, and it is found in bee venom. Those who have uh, had an experience of uh, being stung by a bee will know the pain is uh, 
and cruciating and also last for many hours or even days uh, non-stop in terms of in, uh, intensity of the pain you see what happens is this uh, bradykinin is found in bee venom apart from other proteins but this bradykinin once it gets into uh, your tissue it will cause a contraction uh, of a smooth muscle uh, smooth muscle contraction will cause the blood vessel to dilate uh, meaning the fluid in the blood will rush into the space between uh, the cells it will accumulate and cause inflammation and the inflammation will pressed upon uh, pain nerves when that happens you will feel pain as long there is inflammation uh, so as long there's bradykinin there is inflammation and therefore the pain will be there for a long time uh, so how that's how this bradykinin contributes towards the pain well in this slide I give you an example of something that is not found in nature but rather synthesized by man so basically aspartam is a combination of aspartic acid as well as phenylalanine however the phenylalanine uh, been incorporated with a methoxy uh, chain and therefore you will have the methyl ester aspartic uh, phenylalanine it is a synthetic artificial sweetener that is uh, commonly used in diet soft drinks you see it's possible to get the carbohydrate sugar that is a table uh, sugar of uh, sucrose which is uh, uh, grown as sugarcane and then to be extracted to become sucrose or tablespoon uh, table sugar but that is uh, time consuming as well as labor intensive but in this way of using, using aspartam it's possible not only to uh, generate it in a factory but also found it is 180 times much more sweeter than the sucrose and uh, the aspartam itself the configuration will be in uh, L form however if it's been slightly changed to become D amino acid the end result will be uh, something that has been very sweet to become bitter taste altogether In this slide, we look at some of the biological uh, contribution uh, given by certain amino acid. So you have uh, the uh, glutamate as well as tryptophan uh, giving rise to GABA, uh, which is a, an important neurotransmitter in our body. Also uh, tryptophan uh, giving rise to serotonin and melatonin. Uh, you can see a bottle of serotonin sold as supplement in the pharmacy uh, people with low levels of serotonin uh, are known to be in uh, sad uh, mode and those above the average level are known to be happier so serotonin is important as uh, in that context while melatonin uh, low levels of melatonin uh, causes the person uh, not to sleep well and if it is uh, uh, be above normal uh, average value then the person uh, sleep uh, soundly and in fact also able to dream uh, next you have uh, the contribution of uh, amino acid being the precursor for uh, making of complex nitro nitrogen containing molecules such as the base of a nucleic acid 
we will cover in detail on how uh, the certain amino acids such as uh, glutamine, uh, aspartic acid, will be utilized in the making of pyrimidine as well as purine uh, base structures in the lecture of nucleic uh, acid metabolism. You also have the pigment of chlorophyll to be made from uh, certain amino acids. On the third facts, we also have uh, several standard or non-standard amino acid uh, that has been uh, uh, utilized. Uh, example given is arginine, citrulline as well as onithine. When we go to the lecture of amino acid metabolism, you will actually see a pathway that is having these three uh, amino acid in urea cycle. Uh, these three uh, amino acid are not those belonging to the 20 uh, important amino acid. Now we come to the protein uh, organization that is uh, looking into primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary. It is basically from top to the bottom uh, in terms of increasing in complexity in a particular, particular protein. Some protein will have uh, one, two, three uh, complexity that is primary, secondary, tertiary uh, within one subunit. But uh, if it is more than one subunit, then it is referred up to quaternary complexity. We firstly look at the primary structure where the primary structure is made up of amino acids that is been put in sequence and uh, it has peptide bronze or amide bonds in between and a uh, little bit on the uh, this peptide bond as well as amide bond you can see here uh, been referred the rotation is unable or restricted uh, the rotation between carbon and nitrogen because the electrons from oxygen here will get uh, delocalized and form double bond between carbon and nitrogen. Therefore, it's impossible to twist or rotate the whole uh, peptide chain uh, because of the uh, bonds between carbon and nitrogen at times known to be double bond. Also been highlighted the fact about this uh, nitrogen and hydrogen, carbon and oxygen to be 180 degrees away from each other. Uh, this is also because of the uh, delocalization of the electrons between uh, carbonyl to the carbon and nitrogen. Now we look at secondary structure. Secondary structure comes about because of the hydrogen bond. Hydrogen bonds are, can be referred as slightly electrostatic uh, charges. It's not fully uh, positive or fully negative charges, but only slightly positive or slightly negative charges. And Normally, it comes about due to nitrogen having hydrogen and carbon with oxygen. Due to the electrons here, the hydrogen uh, will be, the electrons will be pulled towards the oxygen. Therefore, the hydrogen will be slightly positive charge. Well, since the electrons are all focused to the oxygen, that will be negatively charged. Therefore, the hydrogen bond comes about. And because of the hydrogen bond, in a polypeptide or straight chain polypeptide, uh, it is likely to give rise to two types of uh, secondary structure. One is alpha helix while the other is being referred as beta pleated sheet. We look into each one of them in the next slides to come.
So here you have uh, information related to alpha helix form where due to certain uh, area having hydrogen bond it uh, forms this alpha helix and uh, this alpha helix has a twist in right-handed spiral as you can see uh, shown here uh, the spiral Okay. Interestingly, it is right-handed, uh, not left-handed. If it's uh, right-handed, it will give rise to clockwise rotation. Yeah. If you manage to uh, figure it out. If you look from the bottom, you will see that it is actually going in right-handed. Okay. Uh, if it was left-handed, it will be anti-clockwise. However, for alpha helix, it will be in right-handed uh, spiral. And you also can see the hydrogen bonds at certain location is the reason behind uh, the formation of alpha helix form. Uh, here shown the other uh, secondary structure which is beta pleated sheet. Uh, basically in a single polypeptide chain it's possible to have this uh, beta pleated sheet where it is like a corrugated shape uh, okay so it's like up and down up and down again it's due to the hydrogen bond that goes from within the polypeptide chain itself okay. just uh, don't get confused this uh, blue platform is just to show you about the corrugated shape uh, the up and down shape that is found in beta pleated sheet next we cover the tertiary structure the tertiary structure is uh, uh, you can imagine it's due to one polypeptide chain uh, bending and folding and uh, coming together because of the interactions either hydrophobic electrostatic van der waals uh, hydrogen bond as well uh, and it is uh, making into one subunit okay. so that's the tertiary structure and uh, the statement here the second statement this uh, long uh, paragraph here is all about uh, you have globular protein that will make into enzyme hormone this uh, globular protein the core the inside is normally hydrophobic while the outside is normally hydrophilic meaning the core you, uh, the amino acid that is found in the core in the middle is normally amino acid uh, which are hydrophobic types while the outside more of hydrophilic uh, types of uh, R group why because uh, the globular protein the hormone enzyme need to be in water environment the blood environment uh, cell which have water environment so having the hydrophilic type of amino acid at the outside helps in uh, meeting with uh, water environment easily it's just a continuation of the tertiary structure I've already explained that the tertiary structure is uh, one single subunit that is uh, made of one polypeptide chain having all these uh, interaction uh, such as electrostatic interaction you know positive negative charges uh, van der waals 
hydrophobic interaction also this uh, disulfide bond you see these uh, the others that i have referred are all non-covalent but the disulfide bond unlike the others this uh, disulfide bond is uh, comes about because of two cysteine groups coming to have interaction and it is not really uh, non-covalent in fact it is covalent bond so uh, all the others are non-covalent except for disulfide bond to be covalent bond and it helps in the tertiary structure uh, conformation here you have a little bit more on the uh, disulfide bond that has been contributed by cysteine amino acid uh, you see if there is a, a one single polypeptide chain with cysteine located here as well as there within that polypeptide chain itself it is likely to have an interaction within itself and that's been uh, shown here okay. and that's called intramolecular uh, interaction due to the disulfide bond or thiole bridge and if it is uh, two different polypeptide chain uh, as shown here and if cysteine is here and there the interaction will now form like this and this is referred as intermolecular interaction or intermolecular uh, uh, protein okay. the intramolecular type uh, give an example of oxytocin as well as vasopressin these are uh, hormones while intermolecular give an example in the form of insulin yeah, which is also a hormone we now get to see the whole tertiary structure basically the tertiary structure is one long polypeptide it doesn't stay in the form of uh, one dimension uh, that is found in the primary structure if it bends and fold due to certain interaction which uh, mostly non-covalent with only one to be covalent that is uh, disulfide bond it will then uh, form in a very uh, sp specific uh, shape due to the bending and folding and the bending and folding to that specific shape is due to the arrangement of amino acids so you can see uh, this whole uh, subunit is having the secondary structure the beta plated sheet as well as the alpha helix here okay. and also have all the types of non-covalent bonds such as van der waals electrostatic interaction and a hydrogen bond as well apart from the secondary structure you also have hydrogen bond on its own okay? and also one particular covalent bond in the form of disulfide uh, uh, bridge or thiol bridge okay? all this is unique for this particular protein and therefore makes up the tertiary structure for that protein itself we now come to the quaternary structure uh, that is the highest level in a protein uh, not all proteins should have this uh, quaternary structure they could just uh, limit themselves to the tertiary structure uh, quaternary structure is much more to uh, to proteins that have more than one subunit uh, that means more than one polypeptide chain come together to form a few subunits and these subunits are kept together again because of the R uh, side chain of amino acids 
that is found within the uh, protein itself. So here, give an example of hemoglobin, which is made up of uh, four subunits. Uh, two subunits are similar to each other. That is the alpha chain, uh, two alpha chain, while two beta chain. So altogether four uh, chains of polypeptide. And also it's supported by not only to be protein entirely, also have this uh, protoporphyrin uh, structure uh, within in the middle of the uh, polypeptide or the subunit. And uh, it also have a metal element in the form of uh, Ferrum, uh, ferrum uh, it will absorb oxygen, uh, so it's useful in uh, uh, linking with the oxygen because it's a carrier of oxygen. So it's a good example to uh, show about the uh, quaternary structure. As uh, usual, I will now end the lecture with the student section. Uh, if we were doing this in a classroom, uh, I would have had you to be in a small group uh, to either choose uh, either one of these topics, discuss among yourself, or to choose uh, uh, to discuss all the topics. And after some time, I'll call uh, randomly a group to the front and actually uh, describe uh, to the whole class what has to be discussed among yourself for uh, proper answer. Unfortunately, we are not in the classroom setting, so I request of you to do it on your own. You will see when you take another course in biotech program, that is enzyme technology, these will be the topics that you will learn in uh, that subject.